So give me your thoughts on this place. The Creation Museum. You will never find a more wretched hive of dumb and villainy. My name is Seth Andrews. I host the online community, The Thinking Atheist. On October 5th, 2012, I grabbed my camera and I joined a group of fellow atheists near Petersburg, Kentucky for my first ever tour of the Creation Museum. And as I documented the experience, I also wanted to get the opinions and perspectives of the other skeptics who had driven from across the region to take the tour with me. I'm going because uh, from the first time I heard about it, I thought it was uh, just something I had to go see to believe. For me, uh, I, was, I was never a believer, never raised up in it. So when I think of exactly what they believe, young earth creationists, it goes against all that I've come to learn and understand. Being from Kentucky, I had to see this. I mean, this is just typical Kentucky. They take the Bible totally, literally, and tra and say, you know, if, if it doesn't agree with the Bible, that it must be wrong. So they, you know, the whole presuppositionalism. I'm going because I'm actually trained as a folklorist. At the same time as a folklorist, I am a non-believer. And there are some belief systems that I just personally can't wrap my head around. As much as I try academically to understand, and this is an attempt to do so. What I find is very odd is that it's very close to Big Bone Lick, which is one of the largest fossil finds in North America. How do you feel about going back? Oh, it's fun. <laughs> it's, it's fun. Like it's, in a Pee Wee's Playhouse kind of way. It's a very yeah. Pee Wee's Playhouse right. kind of way. That's good to know. <laughs> Thank you for everything, guys. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a literal interpretation of what scripture says it's, about... It's a literal interpretation of what Ken Ham says. I don't know that I would actually say that it's more important that it has anything to do with scripture. I, I really think that uh, you're going to find people that are going to argue fundamentally against what Ham believes, but they'll still be creationists. You'll find old earth, you'll find theistic creationists, you'll find theistic evolutionists. It's really more important, I think, at the Creation Museum that everything meshes with Ham's belief. I'd heard a lot about this place and its founder, Ken Ham, of Answers in Genesis fame. I'd seen photos and footage on the internet. But today, my new friends and I were going to experience the Creation Museum for ourselves. Would we demolish contradictions? Would we discover truth? Would we find the meaning of life? For your approval, I present here the top 10 lessons that I learned at the Creation Museum. I think this is very telling. It says Creation Museum, drop the coins into the launch ramp and watch the fun. Of course kids love dinosaurs, everybody loves dinosaurs. And at the Creation Museum, dinosaurs are everywhere. They're all part of the adventure. They greet you in the parking lot. They dazzle you in the lobby. They pose for photographs with you. They're everywhere you look, including your admission ticket. And of course, they're in the gift shop. But I mean, who's the who's the girl? She's clothed, so she's not Eve. Are they just? Those are the early human girls playing with the dinosaurs before the fall. That's right. In the Garden of Eden, dinosaurs apparently coexisted with human beings, like pets or companions, or even close friends. As we moved even further into the museum, every corner seemed to have something designed to capture the imaginations and mold the minds of young children and is seen in everything from the words and lives of Old Testament heroes to an exhibit about the famous 1925 Scopes trial. The message presented was crystal clear. You can actually see the word attack used here. Of course, if God is truly omnipotent, all-powerful, I'm not sure exactly how this attack poses a problem, but the Creation Museum folks were pretty alarmed about it. 
and from their perspective, the offensive volleys were coming from a place that many would never expect, the respected men and women of science. Their claims were automatically wrong because their findings were man's word and not God's word. And God's word doesn't say that humans are evolved primates on a 4.5 billion year old planet in a 13.7 billion year old universe. No, God's word says something different. Yes, once upon a time in the Garden of Eden, there was Adam. Here he is, enjoying God's beautiful garden, along with his lamb and his penguin and his vegetarian dinosaur. Adam and Eve tended garden, but as they were naked and not ashamed, apparently they also tended to each other. And for a while, all was well. But unfortunately, Adam and Eve obviously hadn't learned lesson six. The serpent's temptation led to the eating of the forbidden fruit, and this angered God. Adam and Eve were immediately evicted from paradise, and the whole world went to shit. Because... This single act of rebellion thousands of years ago is the reason we have starving children and predatory animals and wars and pain and crime and death and the Nazis. It's the reason we have to lock our doors at night. Adam and Eve's sin even destroyed the vegetarian diet. Because man sinned in the garden, now even the animal kingdom must struggle to survive. So we have the corpse of its prey. And it didn't stop there. To add to the mountain of self-inflicted cosmic pain, we were all informed that Adam and Eve's sin was responsible for one of the most heinous evils of all time. That's right. Our sin created weeds. Humankind would soon infest the planet like weeds, the entire global population coming from a single family. Of course, this shouldn't be a cause of concern for us because of lesson number nine. All humans are related, so whenever someone gets married, they marry their relative. Genesis 5.4 teaches Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. Originally, brothers had to marry sisters. Incest was okay. Unfortunately, the gene cesspool was still tainted by that single act of disobedience in the garden, and the evil of humankind would ultimately boil over into a global flood for which there was only one escape, Noah's Ark, a lifeboat for the few faithful who would be spared. The Creation Museum spent a lot of time educating us about the Ark, how it was built, how the fossil record proved that the flood happened, how the animals boarded the Ark two by two, how the stalls were designed and maintained, and how aid people successfully cared for thousands of animals, like pets. The Creation Museum put this great mystery together like a children's puzzle. There I am right there, putting the puzzle together. And I was invited along with everyone else to enjoy God's great solution. If there was a recurring theme that I noticed during my tour, outside of how evil the teachings of evolution are, it was that God's word was never to be questioned. Ever. In fact, everywhere I looked, those two words kept conspicuously popping up. God's word, God's word, God's word, God's word. Always trust and obey God's word. And whatever you do, don't put your trust in human reason. The mind given to us is merely a conduit for misinformation. Thinking for ourselves is what caused all of our troubles to begin with. The answers lie only in one place, 
and we've already covered that. Okay, beyond my tongue-in-cheek look at the assertions made by the Creation Museum, I found the entire experience jarring. I am sickened to think of the thousands of impressionable, insulated children brought there by religious parents to continue their brainwashing. I'm angry that so much of what is presented is called legitimate science. I worry about how much damage this indoctrination house is doing. And as I spoke to my friends who also took the tour, I discovered that I'm not the only one. Give me some thoughts. What, what, are, what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking that the animatronics were really good, but the information was totally false. Very, very, very little of this has anything at all to do with science. This is scary. Uh, it's so well made and so slick that it, it even looks like science when it's not. Calling it Creation Museum is a kind of a misnomer because it's not really about creation and it's not really a museum. These people are fantastic at getting a story out. It's just a terrible story. <laughs> this is a story that's full of falsehoods. It's full of things that science has never said, or if it has, it's been some bad scientists that everybody else has kicked out of the club. <laughs> I think it's really sad for kids that don't get any other information. And the number of small children that I saw come through today, that that's what we're teaching them. And there are children around running through there saying, this is awesome. And it saddens me. It saddens me because this is what our future could be. And it, it, I don't think it bodes well for American education and America in general that these kind of places exist. They're going to end up not having good information, reliable information. It doesn't matter what religion you are. Science is, is a, a universal language. If we don't make the start of saying, no, it's time for this to end because this is the ending. <laughs> Ultimately, in my opinion, the Creation Museum is a slick, fanciful, high-dollar guilt trip. It's a church decorated with dinosaurs. And if I had been the one to actually name this particular Kentucky attraction, I wouldn't have called it the Creation Museum. No, to me, there's another title that seems just about perfect. Thank you.